So nobody's going to leave and go to the testing talk with Nikki? One person. <laughs> cool. All right. That's cool. I understand. Um, so I'm going to be talking today a little bit about uh, how to architect your InfluxDB for specifically IoT. Um, there are some things that are going to be similar to how you might work with uh, traditional DevOps or web-based application. Um, and then I'm also going to talk a little bit about uh, some industrial IoT specific stuff um, and integration points and, and things like that. Uh, at the very end, I'll show a short demo um, just of some work that David Simmons, our IoT evangelist, uh, has been doing lately uh, that he was kind enough to share with me. Um, so we'll get started. Uh, the first thing I wanted to talk about uh, is this question, where do we collect our IoT data, right? Um, and there's a couple options, right? There's, there's a centralized option and there's distributed collection. Um, and the answer to this question really depends on uh, sort of how, you know, who is using the data, how you plan on using the data, what the specific applications are. So I'll talk in general terms, um, but as always, there's going to be variation once you dig down into the nitty gritty and start implementing these things yourself. Uh, so the first option is to collect in the cloud, right? Uh, an Influx Cloud is a, is a perfect option for this. Um, it speaks HTTP, so most of your IoT devices will be able to just connect to it directly um, and start sending data there. Uh, in this example, all data flows directly to the cloud, right? Uh, so you might have a, a consumer IoT device that's connected to the cloud and sending out data or something like that, uh, but there's no intermediary. There's no edge device, there's no um, routers, there's no pipeline. Uh, all the data is flowing directly from your device directly into the cloud environment. Um, one of the benefits of this is that you get analysis and visualizations from anywhere, right? You have a single source of truth, um, and anyone can connect to that single source of truth and build visualizations and dashboards and analytics. Um, and you don't have to worry about whether or not the data is up to date, uh, if it's stale, if it's located in the wrong place, or anything like that. Um, so it's centralized, it's easy to access uh, for everyone who's involved in the process. Uh, it lets you take advantage of infrastructure as a service, right? Um, this is a huge cost and effort benefit to the company, right? You don't have to uh, run your own infrastructure, you don't have to deploy edge devices, you don't have to install and, and maintain InfluxDB or anything like that. Uh, you can use a service like Influ Influx Cloud uh, and just start pointing your data there uh, and taking advantage of all the hard work that we've done for you. Um, the downside of this is that you're at the mercy of your network connection, right? Uh, latency, throughput, availability, cost, all of these things become an issue. Um, if you don't have a high availability network, then you could potentially lose data depending on the size of the buffers in your devices. Um, for things that have time critical components, uh, this can be a showstopper, right? If you need to very quickly react to things that are happening uh, on a factory floor or in a manufacturing situation, uh, then this probably isn't going to work for you, right? Um, if you look at sort of response times in the DevOps world, uh, you know, you could potentially be looking at metrics coming in every second or every five seconds or something like that. But in an industrial IoT space uh, where these things are really critical uh, and where, you know, the, the pressure in a pump or a valve on an oil rig could, you know, go from nothing to way too much uh, in a few milliseconds, um, and that could potentially be a life-threatening situation, um, depending on the industry that you're working in, uh, then all of a sudden that sort of fast response time becomes increasingly more important. Um, so you're probably not going to be interested in shipping all of your data to the cloud in those kinds of situations. Uh, but it is well suited for consumer IoT, right? Um, and there is a, a big difference between consumer IoT and industrial IoT. Uh, consumer IoT in a lot of ways operates similar to traditional web services in that you have a large number of users, they're well distributed, uh, the traffic patterns are probably more consistent than with a website or something like that, uh, but you still have that decentralized, distributed uh, nature of your data coming in and, and the way that it's being shipped there. Um, <clears throat> so that's not entirely uh, appropriate for, but it's not entirely appropriate for industrial IoT. So the next option potentially would be to collect data on site, right? Uh, in this situation, the data is collected close to the sensor, uh, potentially in the same logic controller or SCADA apparatus that you're using in your factory. Um, you are afforded local processing and analysis, right? Uh, industrial IoT and automation in factories has been around for a long time. Um, there's a lot of processes that require, un require 
<coughs> excuse me, input from the sensors coming in from their de from various devices and measurements, right? Uh, looking at temperature, looking at pressure, um, and making millisecond adjustments to the processes as you're going through them. So you do have that ability um, even when you're doing collection locally on site. Uh, this is super appropriate when you have an unreliable backhaul network, right? Um, if you don't necessarily know that your data is going to be able to get to some foreign data center or some infrastructure as a service. Um, it's also appropriate if you don't have requirements for centralized storage or, or analysis. Um, and that's traditionally been the way that, in, that IoT and, or sorry, not IoT, but manufacturing and industry has worked, right? Uh, there is no immediate need for looking at that data and doing analysis. Those are all things that they can potentially come by later and maybe copy stuff directly off the devices and do that. Um, so if, if those things are true, then potentially collecting on site um, would be a valuable proposition for you. Uh, but there is a third way, and this is a, a phrase that was coined by David Simmons, again, uh, our IoT evangelist, uh, and that's this idea of a data layer, layer architecture, right? Uh, the idea that not only can you have collection and data processing at the edge, uh, but you can also have collection and data processing uh, in, the, in, in the cloud, in the infrastructure. Um, and the two can be complementary. So in this situation, data would be collected at the edge, close to the sensor, close to the device that's producing it. Um, and the edge collectors would be capable of processing that data. Uh, and this is becoming in, uh, increasingly feasible in the modern world. Um, I think in part because of the, the drive towards consumer smartphones and all of the process advancements and improvements that have made, been made there. Um, you can get really small, really cheap devices uh, with a tremendous amount of power. The Raspberry Pi 4 just came out. It's more of a consumer application than an industrial one. Uh, but it's using similar components, right? It's using an ARM-based processor. It's using, it's got four gigs of RAM. It's got gigabit ethernet. Uh, this is a pretty powerful device that you can do a lot of stuff on, and they're selling it to consumers for, for 40 bucks or 55 bucks if you want the, if you want the four gig version. Um, so at that cost, you can start affording to put these things everywhere. You can, you, you can have a building with smart lighting you know, on every floor, and on each one of those floors, you can have an individual edge device that's, that's managing and collecting data and doing all those things. Uh, cost is no longer a prohibitive uh, reason for not building out these kinds of systems. Um, the edge collectors in this case can handle local events and trigger actuation. Um, you're probably going to want to layer this in, in some way or another, right? You're going to have your industrial devices, they're going to be reading sensors, and they're going to make automatic adjustments as time goes by uh, based on the data coming off of those sensors. And then you'll probably also have someone else working on the factory floor or, or whatever uh, who's responsible for things like maintenance and addressing issues that aren't uh, auto-remediated, right? They're not something that the logic controller inside these devices uh, can take care of. And instead, they have to send a human out to take a look and figure out what exactly is going wrong. Um, systems like this are extremely complicated, and there is always a point at which the auto-remediation, those sensor systems, those feedback loops that you built aren't quite enough to handle all of the unforeseen situations that are going to come up. Um, so that's when these local events trigger not only actuation, but alerts for individuals so that they can go out and, and take a look at what's actually going on. Um, from the edge device, you can actually then forward that data to a centralized backend, right? Um, and as you're doing that, you can actually downsample the data to reduce costs, right? Um, and that's really important. You know, it kind of addresses the issue of the unreliable network. It, is, it addresses the issue of the cost of transport of all of that data across the network because now you can do stuff like collect data at you know, millisecond intervals on your local devices and be able to react very quickly to issues as they come up uh, within your, your environment, uh, but also send you know, downsampled one minute resolution, two minute resolution stuff up to you know, the central cloud uh, the more administrative staff at the company so that they can understand the general working of the environment and things like that. So this is a diagram of sort of what the data layer architecture might look like. Um, and on the left-hand side, you have a bunch of devices that are connected uh, with a variety of protocols, right? Um, so generally out there, you know, in the consumer space, you'll see a lot of uh, uh, Wi-Fi wi stuff. You'll see a lot of BLE stuff. Uh, and then you start moving into the industrial space where you see, or sorry, 
uh, you, you also see Z-Wave, which is uh, sort of disappearing in the home automation market, but, but it's still there. Uh, Modbus, things like that. And then as you move on, um, you have more and more industrial solutions and things that aren't really available uh, to the average consumer. But there are a ton of these things out there, right? There are serial protocols, there's wireless protocols, uh, there's all different ways to connect to the actual devices themselves. Um, and oftentimes that is, uh, especially in an industrial IoT scenario up until recently, uh, those have been proprietary things. So that last bit of connection can be complicated, right? It might require programmable logic controllers, it might require microcontrollers or embedded systems or something like that that know how to directly access the sensors and work with them. Um, the other nice thing about this architecture is that that edge device can fulfill multiple functions, right? It doesn't have to just be something that routes uh, sensor data. Uh, it can also provide Wi-Fi access. It can monitor network connections. You can do a little bit of the monitoring of the infrastructure alongside of the monitoring of your sensors and things like that. Um, there's a few key considerations for IoT data uh, that make influx data appropriate for that use case. Um, the first is that IoT data needs to be timely, right? Uh, if it's not timely, if you're not looking at it quickly, then it's really probably not valuable, right? It means that you aren't able to react to things when they happen, um, solve problems, address issues, that kind of stuff. So ingestion rates and query efficiency are really, really important, um, especially when we get to the scale uh, that, you know, people like Gartner and, and all those folks are talking about IoT reaching in the near future. Uh, IoT data also has to be accurate, right? Um, data integrity, platform reliability, these are critical components of any IoT infrastructure, uh, and they become more and more critical as you move out of the consumer space and into the industrial space. Uh, and finally, IoT data has to be actionable, right? Um, if you're reading all this data, if you're storing it locally, uh, or even if you're sending it to the cloud, if you don't have the ability to do data visualizations, data exploration, uh, if you can't do anomaly detection and alerting on your data, uh, then the data might as well not exist. Um, so back to those uh, analysts at Gartner. Um, this is a number I pulled a little while back in terms of uh, how many IoT devices they expect to be out there in the future. Um, 20 to 50 is the number that I usually see. Um, and in those IoT devices, it's also very rare that they're going to be outputting a single stream of data, right? Uh, there's a, a high chance that there's, you know, one or more sensors inside there, and they're sending not only, you know, 20 billion devices, but 20 billion devices times 10 or 15 data streams and however much data that's present um, in those streams. So, again, another number I've heard is 11.5 zettabytes of data, which <coughs> is a lot of data. Um, and so I think that's, you know, another place where InfluxDB and the ability to scale horizontally uh, and ingest large amounts of data uh, makes it really the right platform for, for working with this kind of information. Um, I wanted to talk more about integrating with industrial IoT systems. Um, industrial IoT, aka, you know, Industry 4.0, uh, the next industrial revolution, this idea that everything that we build uh, from factories to cars um, to food manufacturing plants um, are going to be censored, you know, wired up with sensors and automated and instrumented uh, so that we can learn from the systems and understand them and improve the processes and, you know, uh, have all these benefits in terms of cost and efficiency and things like that. Uh, but up until recently, um, industrial IoT data was actually really difficult to work with, right? Uh, this is sort of a traditional uh, architecture of uh, an industrial IoT site, right? You'll have a variety of PLCs or programmable logic controllers uh, that are all connecting to a single SCADA controller. And SCADA stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. Um, and these things are the microcontrollers themselves. The PLCs are generally embedded in the devices. Uh, they control the immediate responses based on those sensors, sensor readings. Um, they are able to actuate things like in the case of a, a fermenter in, a, you know, in a, in a brewing, uh, in, a, in a brewery. Um, they're able to look at things like temperature and pressure and make sure that the pressure is appropriate and the temperature is appropriate. And when the brewing cycle is done, they can raise the temperature to sterilize the, the system and all those kinds of things. 
Um, generally, they talk back to a SCADA controller, uh, which controls a variety of these devices across the floor of the factory or the brewery or whatever else you're, you're working on. Um, and up until this, until relatively recently, that's kind of where the data is, uh, stops, right? Um, and you'll hear people talk about this as operational technology, right? The technology that people need uh, to actually operate the factories and the power generation plants and the, the food production plants um, that, that are using these systems. Uh, and there is a gap between those systems and influx data or any other data backend that you potentially wanted to use. Um, and there weren't a lot of standards, right? If you were interested in doing this kind of thing, uh, it meant that you had to go out there, you had to contact the manufacturer of the specific device that you were working with, you'd have to get a bunch of data sheets from them about what protocols it spoke and all that stuff. Um, and that was a fairly tremendous amount of work. Um, so the next thing to come along was OPC UA. Uh, OPC UA is actually a second generation uh, communications protocol for industrial equipment. Um, it is the successor to OPC. Uh, and one of the things that it does is move from proprietary Microsoft protocols over to TCP. And that move to TP TCP uh, really <laughs> opens up a world of possibilities in terms of how you're actually able to start in interacting with these industrial systems. Um, before, I think it was like some Microsoft OLE protocol that you, know, you had not only uh, was difficult to work with and potentially wasn't compatible with your systems, but had a lot of other issues as well, like security and retries and timeouts and stuff like that. Um, so moving over to TCP was a really big boon for, for this kind of con connectivity. Uh, one of the downsides of OPC UA um, is that it actually came out in about 2006. Um, and it provides data in a hierarchical structure. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Wayfair case study, um, but Wayfair basically is one of our customers. They moved off of a graphite installation and onto InfluxDB. Uh, and one of the drawbacks of graphite is that it also presents data in sort of this hierarchical data structure. Um, and the issue with that is that it's, it's single dimensional, right? You can't slice and dice your data and do analysis and exploration uh, in ways other than what are already provided to you by the hierarchy of the system. Um, so that's a bit problematic, but one of the things that you'll find uh, in industrial systems is that it does take them a long time uh, to actually adopt these types of new technologies. So again, this thing came out in 2006, and I think it's only now starting to be integrated into most common logic controllers. Um, and that makes sense if you think about it, you know, because you have uh, all of these situations where they're investing large amounts of money into physical apparatuses that are being installed into large buildings and stuff like that. It's not as simple as clicking a button and deploying a new build of your code, right? Um, replacing a factory, tearing out logic controllers, changing those kinds of things, those are really hard. Uh, it's really difficult to do. So factory builders and designers and the engineers that work on these projects uh, tend to be fairly conservative. They tend to wait for a technology that's really stable and robust and that they know is gonna work and then they employ that and, and start putting that in, it out into the world. Um, but OPC UA is still you know, better than what came before um, and it starts to open up new uh, possibilities in terms of how you can work with the data and how you can export that data and send it over uh, to something like InfluxDB. So one of the tools that you can use to do that uh, is called Apache NiFi. Um, and NiFi is a data flow automation tool. Uh, it was based on something called Niagara Files developed by the NSA. Um, and it allows for the creation of a scalable directed graph of logic routing, transformation, and system mediation logic. Um, so it really is just a data flow tool. It lets you go ahead and grab data from a specific source and through a really nice uh, GUI interface with arrows and nodes and a typical kind of graph interface, uh, you can direct the flow of that data, you can control transformations on the data, uh, you can do additional uh, enrichment of the data during that process, and then you can also output to mediation systems, so actuators, things like that. Um, Craig Hobbs, one of our SEs, uh, actually wrote a really great blog post about this. Um, and again, I'm pretty sure these slides will be made available to everyone, so you're welcome to take photos, but if you don't want to take photos, um, these links and everything will be available in the slides later. Uh, but in the, in the article, he talks about how to get set up with NiFi, 
um, how to connect it to InfluxDB, uh, how to get that data sort of out of that hierarchical structure and how to translate it into something that's appropriate for measurements and tags in InfluxDB. Uh, and one of the tools that he's using there is this NiFi OPC UA bundle, uh, which provides inputs and outputs and data processors specifically for NiFi uh, to correct, to connect to uh, InfluxDB. So this is just a screenshot of what that actually looks like once, once you build it out. I'm not gonna dig too much into the details. Uh, but on the left-hand side, you have this ingestion node, right? Um, and it uses a few of the processors from that bundle. And then on the right-hand side, you have the InfluxDB node. So it's basically just passing data from that bottom node on the bottom left corner uh, over into the right-hand side and into the InfluxDB um, and doing the transformations that are, that are required to, uh, to make that work. Um, this is an amazingly powerful tool. It's a lot of fun to work with as well. Um, I personally like the data flow sort of model of programming, being able to work with a graphical visualization and being able to say, oh yeah, you know, my data is going down this path or it's going down this path. Uh, but NiFi has a lot of options for manipulating and enriching and transforming your data. Um, and so I think if that's something, a requirement that you have, this is, this is definitely something uh, that's worth looking at. Another option um, is from a company called Factory. Uh, the founder of Factory actually spoke at Influx Days in London uh, recently. Um, you can find the video on YouTube. Uh, but he went into a lot of detail about uh, some of their open source OPC UA clients and servers and how to integrate those with your industrial IoT solutions. Um, so this company has been around for a little while. Uh, they work with industrial automation. They uh, build solutions using Influx data. Uh, so this is part of uh, you know, their, their, um, the product that they offer to customers is integration with Influx and the ability to store data and access it and, and work with it there. Um, so they produce two pieces of technology that are both uh, really, really useful for working with industrial IoT. Uh, the first is this node OPC UA logger. Um, and this is basically just a way for you to actually connect to an OPC UA system to read data out of the system, to traverse the hierarchy, to determine which nodes you need to read, um, and then to forward that data onto InfluxDB. It's really easy to set up. You can set it up in a simple configuration file where you give the node IDs from OPC UA uh, that you want to read from, um, and then it'll automatically send the data to Influx. It's built in node.js. It's pretty efficient. Um, and it's my understanding that this has actually been running in production in factories since about 2016. Uh, so it is a stable and tested piece of software. It's something that folks are actively using um, <clears throat> in the world right now, in the industry for, for working with their data. Um, on the other hand, and this is something that NiFi doesn't provide and which I think is really interesting, is this OPC UA server, right? So all of these examples so far, or both of these examples so far, involve reaching out to the influx or into the OPC UA servers, pulling data down from there and sending them out to InfluxDB which is great, it means that you can start doing analytics, you can start doing alerting, you can start doing um, all sorts of stuff on that data. Uh, but the one thing that it doesn't give you is the ability to do some sort of calculation or analysis on your data and transform that into actions that your SCADA systems and your PLCs can then take. Um, and that's what this OPC UA server does. It basically takes the InfluxDB data, translates it back from tags and measurements and fields into a hierarchical format uh, that OPC, can, OPC UA can serve up um, and that your SCADA controllers can connect to and, and look at data from um, and actually start to do, uh, <coughs> take actions based on that data. So you might look at this as uh, you have, you know, a variety of different inputs from sensors um, and based on the combination of those inputs, uh, you might want to change the values of your actuators or something like that. Um, one example that he gave in a talk was a sensor, a turbidity sensor, um, which only really is, gives off important data when it's running. Um, and when it's not running, it's still spitting out data, uh, but it's kind of gibberish. So to do any analysis on that data stream, you have to be able to combine that data stream of the data coming off of the turbidity sensor with the data coming off of the device that says whether or not it's off or on so that you can take those periods where it's spitting out gibberish, you can exclude them from your analysis, and then you can actually make intelligent decisions based on the data that remains. Um, so with either of those tools, 
uh, this is what the, the architecture for IoT looks like after the fact, right? You still have those PLCs, you still have the SCADA controllers, but now in the, in the middle you have these OPC UA connectors. Um, and they really let you do uh, a whole lot of stuff outside of what you might otherwise do um, with OPC or with, with data coming out of an industrial IoT system. Um, <clears throat> the next thing that I wanted to talk a bit about was the benefits of Flux for IoT data. Um, so Flux is really exciting for a lot of people. There's, it addresses a lot of issues with InfluxQL uh, that people hadn't previously uh, been able to get around except with capacitor or something like that. Um, but the number one request, obviously, is math across measurements, right? Everybody has always wanted math across measurements, and now Flux lets you do that. Um, and math across measurements is one of the things that enables that use case that I was talking about just a few minutes ago uh, with the turbidity sensor, right? Those are two separate measurements uh, that are going into the database, right? There's the turbidity data, there's the on-off data, and to work with those two things together, uh, in the past, you would have had to use capacitor or something similar. Um, now you can turn to flux and you can turn to math across measurements uh, and you can start to do really interesting things uh, with the data that's coming in from, from various data streams. Um, so a couple of the examples that I'll, I'll show you at the end um, are making use of the ideal gas laws to calibrate uh, the baseline for CO2 sensors and also to do heat index calculations. So heat uh, and temperature is not necessarily 100% uh, related to how we or even machines perceive temperature, right? The temperature in the room uh, might feel hotter or colder depending on how much humidity there is or, or other factors, wind or things like that. Um, so you can actually be, start to take data from not only your temperature sensors but your humidity sensors and combine them and do math across measurements and compute these heat indexes that show you, yeah, oh wow, it, you know, it's 78 degrees but it, it feels like it's 82 or something like that. Uh, another huge benefit of Flux is the idea of user packages and distribution, right? Um, not everybody is going to want to build their own ideal gas law functions or heat index functions or, you know, with these turbidity sensors. Um, the idea that individuals who do this work once can then share that with the rest of the community um, and everyone can benefit off of it uh, will hopefully make everybody's lives a lot easier and make it so that you can get productive with the software even faster than you were before. Um, so one of the things that David Simmons is doing is he's actually building an environmental package uh, with a large number of scientific functions for use with sensors, right? Uh, so heat index is going to be one of them. There's, there's a whole bunch of, of other stuff in there. And the flux can get a little bit gnarly at times, right? There's, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of computation. Uh, so being able to bundle that up and package it and share it with other people uh, and make their lives easier uh, is, a, is a huge boon to, to us as developers. Uh, finally, <coughs> there's the sql.from function. Um, so this is something that folks have been interested in, in the long, uh, for a long time, uh, being able to actually pull in data from multiple data sources. Uh, this is something that Flux currently enables and Katie Farmer will be giving a talk later on today uh, specifically about the sql.from function. Um, but one of the great things here is that you can now start to integrate the sensor metadata uh, with the time series data itself, right? You can keep your relational database in a, or you can keep your relational data in a relational database, and you can keep your time series data in a time series database, and you can use Flux to bring them both in together um, and start working with them and actually be able to display things like the location of your sensors and the type of sensor and the brand and things like that. Um, so I'm going to go quickly for about five minutes, just show you a couple dashboards and stuff that uh, David has been working on. Um, I don't have hardware right here. It's actually in David's house in North Carolina, but we're going to be looking at uh, what sensors he's actually using. So the first one is the Sensair K30. It's a non-disruptive infrared, uh, infrared sensor for detecting CO2. Um, this is actually a pretty interesting sensor. I found a paper out there about it. Um, that basically talks about how, you know, for 200 bucks, you can get a sensor that is comparable in a lot of ways um, to $1,000 sensors or $2,000 sensors or much more expensive industrial equipment. Um, and part of the reason that, that you can actually make this work uh, is by combining it with other sensors and using them to calibrate uh, the CO2 sensor. So the other sensor that we're going to be working with is one of these Bosch BME 280s. Uh, it's an integrated temperature, humidity, and pressure sensor. Um, and it lets you do a whole bunch of stuff 
uh, in terms of being able to calculate, you know, use the ideal gas laws to verify that your CO2 is, um, you know, where exactly your CO2 is. Uh, David is using a Pine64 as his edge device. I believe it has one or two gigs of RAM. It has a quad-core processor, a um, whole bunch of GPIO, GPIO pins, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Ethernet, those kinds of things. Um, but again, it's one of these examples of a really inexpensive board based on ARM technology um, that you can pretty much go out there and, and start working with and building systems that you couldn't previously build before. Um, <clears throat> I've actually been looking at something called, I think, a Nano PC T4 or something like that, uh, that actually is a PCI slot on board, uh, or it has an M2 slot and provides four lanes of PCIe. Um, so that means that you can actually drop a high-speed NVMe SSD directly into one of these devices. Um, and that actually addresses the one drawback of using these embedded technologies, which is that they traditionally use things like micro SD cards and, and relatively slow memory uh, for storage. Um, but now that you can start to get these devices with uh, the ability to throw an M2 SSD in there, uh, it means that you can actually address a lot of the issues um, in terms of data performance and write performance on your edge devices. So if you are building one of those systems, I would love to talk to you about it and some of the hardware that you want to use. Um, so I will pull this up real quickly. Um, let me just... see that? Sort of. Uh, so this is an OSS instance. It's not in Flux Cloud. Uh, the reason for that is that there's a lot of experimental stuff in there that isn't currently generally available. Um, so David's been building and compiling these some things himself and, and sharing them with me and, and the rest of the team. Um, so we have a bunch of dashboards in here uh, with no data. see if we can get any data out of them. All right, there we go. Um, so we have the last hour of data, and over here on the top left, I know it's a little bit hard to read in the back, I'm sure, uh, it says raw versus compensated CO2. Uh, so the blue one is the raw CO2, and the purple one is the compensated CO2. And you can see they're pretty close, right? For, for a human being looking at this data, it might not make a difference uh, that you know one is 866 ppm and the other is 871. Uh, but for a machine, uh, that becomes even more important. Um, so let's just quickly dig in here and take a look at the flux. Um, so what David's doing is he's actually pulling in data uh, about the temperature, uh, the raw CO2 readings, as well as the pressure readings. And he's using a number of joins to join them together into a single table. Uh, and then he's calling his own uh, flux package, environmental, uh, which eventually will be released to the general public. Um, and which contains a function that bundles up all of the computations you would need to do for an ideal gas law. Uh, so that one's in there, uh, and it probably, I think, must be like 40 lines of flux that it, that it hides from you, so that's really super cool. Um, another thing that he's built in here uh, is this heat index, right? Um, and wow, it's really hot in his office right now. He's on a trip, so the AC is probably off. Um, but you know, you can see that the, the, raw temp uh, the raw temperature in the room is reading as 83.37 degrees, uh, but it's not particularly humid in there. Uh, it's 32% humidity, so the heat index is actually uh, relatively lower than that. And again, if you look at the flux code, um, if you can see that, uh, there's these, he's pulling in data from the variety of different measurements. Uh, he's filtering, he's aggregating, he's doing your usual flux kind of stuff joining the data together uh, into a single table, and then calling out to that environmental package again, uh, this time to the heat index function, uh, which can actually do those kinds of calculations. Um, so that's pretty neat. Uh, and then finally, uh, he's making a number of calls to SQL, uh, to a MySQL server, where he's storing all of the relational data for these sensors. Uh, so he's put this here in the customer data field. Um, it tells you what it tells him what type of microcontroller he's using, what vendor it is, things like that, um, and that can be really helpful if you're starting to look at this stuff. You know, you're you're off, you're you're in headquarters, you're looking at the data, you see that some of the sensors have started to fail on your devices. You want to understand which sensors those are, so you can get the appropriate parts and the appropriate repair crew 
uh, out there to take care of that. So I think there's a second uh, table down here. So the first one de uh, described the actual node that's collecting the sensor data. Uh, and the last one describes the various sensors that are actually connected to that node. Uh, so we have that Sensor K30, uh, we have the BME 280, uh, we've got a number of other sensors in there uh, that I didn't have a chance to talk about. Um, so I think we're getting pretty close to time. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Nobody? No, right here. Oh, awesome. In terms of architecture, like uh, what the, uh, like with influx uh, data, what will be the open source uh, tools for an, uh, uh, data science and machine learning kind of thing? Like is there, you guys suggest anything that we can use these kind of tools for data science and machine learning with influx data? Um, so yeah, I, I think there's a lot of things we can use. Um, it really depends what platform you're on. Uh, hopefully the goal will be that you can use Flux for a lot of that. Right, the goal of Flux is that it's a general purpose data scripting language that you can start to add things like Holt Winters and machine learning into. Um, I think Anis might talk a little bit more about that. Um, but I don't think there is necessarily a system that you can just drop in and have it automatically do the work for you. You sort of have to understand your use cases and, and see where you can fit things in. Uh, but Capacitor 1.6 will be available. That'll, that'll interact with InfluxDB 2.0. Uh, you can do stuff in there. Uh, and as Flux matures and improves, we want to bring more and more of that kind of functionality into the language and the platform itself. Thank you. 